We're in a series called Gathering. I'm actually going to finish it today. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25, I will tell you, um, uh, in August, I'm starting a new series called For the Win. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach on spiritual warfare. Um, teach on how to, what, what, the, what we're going through right now. You know, the stuff we're going through right now, the response of a, of a Christ follower, and how to, how to really deal with, um, with spiritual matters, you know, I, a lot of people don't understand spiritual warfare and prayer and authority, and, and I feel like it's time, it's time for us to come into that and for us to understand that. If not, your default's going to be fear. So when you understand who you are, your default's not fear, but it's faith, because you understand your authority that you've been deputized by Jesus to shoot some devils down, and uh, so we're going to go through that in August and, and pick up for a series called For the Win. Hebrews 10. Verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So week one in this series, we talked about going vertical with God, that that was our response. And I just want you to understand something. When you come in this room now, you're not supposed to be a spectator. You're not in your living room anymore watching online. If you're in here, you're supposed to be engaged in worship. We're supposed to go vertical in our relationship with God, not just singing a song off a wall, but our heart would connect to the things that we're singing. So going vertical together as we gather. Second week was spur one another, which was last week. We determined that we all needed a good kick in the rear end every once in a while just to encourage us along uh, into love and good deeds. And today, I want to talk to you about the results of gathering. What happens when we gather, or what's supposed to happen when we gather together as the body of Christ? As we gather together as the church, what is supposed to happen? You know, I read this this week, and it says this, that individualism tends to breed self-centeredness and consumerism. And what I think has happened sometimes is, is we're living in this individual, in, individually focused mentality or world where it's about us. And so therefore, even when we come to church, we have this idea of consumerism where we're here to consume. You know, pastor, tell me something real good so I can get out of here and I can, I can go down to eat my lunch or, you know, I get my church in for the week and, and I come and I sit and, and consume. Well, that's, that's called individualism and it's created within us self-centeredness. These are the fruits of individualism. And, um, and, but, but also on the other side of it is interdependence where it breeds uh, selfish, selflessness, it breeds service and distribution. When you live with the idea that you're connected to one another, that you're connected to God, and God has a, has a purpose and a calling for your life, and that you're intertwined together, all of a sudden it doesn't become about uh, consuming and, and what I can get out of it or, or, or what I can receive from it. It becomes, how can I become a distributor? And today I want us to realize that individualism will have a tendency to kill unity, and as we, as we go through the word this morning, I'm just going to give you six quick, every preacher's greatest word, quick, six things. He said quick and six. Everybody say quick six. Quick six. You guys are, are you awake? It's 1023 in the morning. Say quick six. Quick six. Amen. Um, and so I'm going to give you quick six when it comes to the results of gathering. What should happen when we come together? What are the results? Is us just coming to a building, singing a few songs and walking away, making sure that, that I get my church in for the week? Are we supposed to come in here expecting something different? See, because I can tell you right now that the church today, we're going to need to expect some things different because the broken world is going to come through these doors. You know, you're going to encounter the broken world when you leave and go to work. So there's something different that has to happen on Sunday in order for you to make an impact sometimes on Monday. Come on. I want you to make an impact on Monday. And the first thing that should happen when we come into this room is healing. Healing. There should be healing that takes place. What do you mean, Pastor? Emotional, physical, mental. I still believe God heals and does miracles today. Well, I don't know where I stand on that one there, Pastor. It's okay. Read the Bible. You know, we all have to come into it and understand it, but I will tell you he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
So I'm not going to shortchange God in the, in, the, in the culture of unbelief that whether God does miracles or not. As I was doing Saturday morning prayer, before I did it, the Lord just really began to deal with me and says, we've had enough, uh, we've had enough de- declaration about sickness. Start declaring that I'm the healer. I'll talk to this side of the room. This side of the room over here is this side sleeping a little bit. This is because the kids are on this side. Healing, emotional, physical, mental. The mental health realm right now is off the chart with people being isolated, bogged down with fear. Kids, man, turn into, turn into other things in their life to cope with stuff. And it, it's become a craziness in our earth today, but that's all you're hearing about. I'm ready for Jesus to take the front page. I'm ready for Jesus to take the front page that he heals and he delivers and he sets free. Healing. We go, listen, you hear me say this all the time. We go to God for forgiveness, but we go to God's people for healing. What do I mean by that? God uses people to be a, that he flows his healing power through for us to be set free and to be healed. We go to God for forgiveness. James 5.16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Confess, pray for each other. When you gather, believe for healing because the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. How many wants results? Well, one of the results of gathering is healing. He tells us in James 5, 16, that we should be experiencing healing, mental, physical, emotional healing. When you leave here, if you're broken today, I want you to understand, you can be healed today. You can be healed in your emotions. You can be healed mentally. You can be healed physically. Well, Jason, you're putting it, you're putting it out there, there today, aren't you there, Pastor? You're yeah, because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, by his stripes we were healed. I'm not going to discredit the Son of God's sacrifice on the cross for me, nor will I only receive part of what he did for me. I'm not only just going to receive forgiveness of sin, but I'm also going to receive healing. I'm also going to receive blessing, because that's what he paid for on the cross. Number two result when you come in the room is encouragement. You should feel encouraged when you leave here. Hebrews chapter 10, you've been in some of them places? Where you just leave and you're like, oh, I just feel like, I just, I just, they beat the heck out of me. Now, if I beat the heck out of you in a good way, then you're welcome. But encouragement, the Bible says, encourage one another as all the more as we see the day approaching. We're in a crazy day right now. People need encouragement. I love what the word encouragement means, and I never heard it put this way until I studied it. To encourage is to give courage. Hear me now. To courage, to encourage, is to give courage. In other words, our overall uh, our culture is discouraging that we live in. We're constantly hearing bad news. We're constantly hearing this. We're constantly hearing that. But when we gather as the church, when we gather together as the body of Christ, we should walk away encouraged. Why? Because somebody came along, or in the service, there was something that filled us with courage again. To be encouraged is to give courage. So there's there's going to be people that maybe this week that were walking through life and they were fighting through struggles and they came to church and we gathered together as the body of Christ and when they leave, they're filled with courage to go out into the world. Encouragement. To be filled with courage. Listen, people are experiencing despair problems. They need to know there is hope. Giving courage to one another. Listen, the times in the life that we live in right now requires it. We're all going through something. We've all been through some. We're all currently going through something, and we'll all go through something again. But at the end of the day, it's not about going through something and going back through something. It's not about that. It's about, hey, God, what is the courage that's going to help me push through it? And what I, what, I, what I desire when we gather and the results when we gather is that we would create a Barnabas environment. Barnabas was Paul's greatest encouragement. He would come along and Paul be shipwrecked and he was on his journey and he was struggling and Barnabas would come along and say, come on, baby, you can do it. Keep going, Paul. Barnabas was Mr. Encouragement. Listen, I don't think that's limited to a person. I think that whole environment of our church can be encouraging. When you walk in the doors, there's friendliness, there's encouragement. There's, hey, how that a boy you can go for, you can do it, you can keep moving. No matter what you're going through, you can experience courage through encouragement. Number three is this, when we gather One of the results is giftings. You're like, what's that mean? Here's what I mean by giftings. Purpose is stirred. 
I like to be in an environment when we gather as the church, one of the results is that our purpose is stirred. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God. Notice what he says, stir up. That's your job. You come into an environment. One of the results of coming together and gathering together is that you'd be stirred up. Man, I'm telling you what, we should leave church on Sunday, ready for Monday, ready to fight hell with a water pistol. Come on, somebody. We should be ready to go. Our purpose should be stirred. Hey, devil, listen, this is what you're bringing into the earth, and this is what we're fighting against. But, baby, greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. Our giftings are stirred. Our purpose we're not just working jobs and starting companies and, 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 and going to a nine to five. No, we're going in there because there's people that are lost and, and God put me in this arena, whether I'm a lawyer or a doctor or work at Burger King, it doesn't matter. God put me in that moment to where God wants to use me and when you come to church on Sunday, something of a purpose and an anointing and grace gets off on you and you get stirred up and you walk into those arenas and influences and all of a sudden God begins to use you in your purpose. 1 Timothy 4.14 says, don't minimize the powerful gift that operates in your life. Well, pastor, you know, I'm just really a nobody. Nobody really knows my name. Listen, nobody, not everybody knows my name either. That doesn't disqualify me. He says this, don't minimize the powerful gift that operates in your life. God put a powerful gift on the inside of you, so stop squishing it. Stop putting it under. Stop downgrading yourself. You're a child of God, and God says one of the results is that your purpose would be lit on fire when you come to church. Something you must understand, that you have a purpose and a gifting, and when we gather together, see, the giftings, the callings, the purposes are stirred when we gather together. Our purpose, man, this is what we're created for. We're created to, this is the locker room. We're gathered together and purpose all of a sudden is ignited. Then we go out into the game of life and we become effective and we start reaching people and we start being a light and we start speaking positive things and we start declaring God's word and we start walking in our gifts and our callings. All of a sudden, man, people's lives are different because you were stirred in your purpose. Number four is that, I mean, hey, I'm more on fire than you're talking back to me this morning, Chech. Number four, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm going to have 12 of them, I'm just going to make six more up, because you ain't talking back, I'll just, we'll just keep going, I'll just make six up. <clears throat> Somebody's like, yes, I'm going to start talking then, he's going to do six more, heck no, nah. crack your barrel. <laughs> Number four, spiritual authority. You know, I don't know if you realize this or not, but when you get offended at church, and things that happen within the church, and you step away from it. You take yourself out under spiritual authority and it's the most dangerous place to live. And you don't hear a lot of talk about this. Why? Because we got a very individual, individualistic mentality. And when you step away from it, you pull yourself out from underneath spiritual authority. And when you do that, all sorts of things can happen in your life. Why? Because we, this word, everybody say the word submit. Oh, we don't like that word. I've done marriage vows where the, where, they, where the lady's like, can you take that out of the... Oh, no, it's in the Bible. Jesus said it. It's not a forced submission. It's a, it's a servanthood submission. So you're, you're putting yourself under authority. Um, and so here's what the Bible says in Matthew 10. The Bible tells us this. Jesus called his 12 disciples together, gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. So he gathered them together... They were under spiritual authority, and he gave them authority. You can only have authority when you're under authority. You can only, you can only have authority when you're under authority. And if you bash authority, you just took yourself out from underneath authority. You understand that? That's a dangerous place to be spiritually. Listen, 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 listen. To have authority, you must place yourself under authority. And listen, authority is not meant to, to uh, uh, authority is meant to release you, not restrict you. Oh boy. Oh boy. It's meant to release you, not restrict you. Well, nobody can tell me what to do. Darn it, I'm my, I'm my own man. I can do whatever I want to do. Uh huh. You can. But don't come running when all hell breaks loose because you made that choice. 
listen to me this morning. It's meant to release you, not restrict you. You don't just get authority. It has to be given to you from someone that's qualified to hand it out. Now, you leave here today, and I go out here, and I get me a police car, and I put me on one of them. Uh, I go down to Foy's Halloween costume place and get me a police officer outfit. Give me a badge, the whole deal. Give me a police car. I go down. I see you speeding. I pull you over. I go up to your window, and I say, hey, I need to see your license and registration. Well, guess what? I don't have any authority to give you a ticket. I was never deputized or authorized to do it. I'm not, under, I'm not under Ohio's jurisdiction of authority. Now, if somebody comes along that's a, that's a state highway patrol and he's been through the academy and he's been up the ranks and he pulls you over, I'll never forget it. You want to hear a funny story? Your pastor speeds a lot. Break the laws of the land, dear God. So many ways. Bless you. So many ways. Listen to me this morning. Here, here's, I was coming up I-70. And I don't know what I was doing. I was speeding. And I've never had this happen to me before. And this is an example of authority. I got to the top of the hill, and I mean, I was rolling. Coming off 75, my wife's going to be like, where, where was I when you were rolling down the highway? She's here, so I know she's going to say something at some point. So anyway, um, so I, was, I came around the corner, and I came around the thing, and I started going up 70, and I mean, I was rolling. And I got to the top of the hill, and there was a police officer standing outside of his car. He had the gun just like this, the radar gun. Not the. <laughs> I needed to qual- I needed to qualify what I was saying. The radar gun's pointing at me, and I mean instantly. He set the radar gun on the hood, and I just watched him. It was like slow motion. He went like this, like no lights, no cameras, nothing. Just his little finger. And I mean, I tell you what, I'm not kidding. Here was his police car. I come up over that hill, and I seen him point me off the road. I went just like this. I mean, it was just like that. I didn't even look up. He came to the other side. I just handed him the registration and the license. He didn't even talk to me. Came back, gave me. We didn't even have a conversation until the end. He said, good day, sir. That's authority. Like, he, he, had the, he had been backed by the state of Ohio. Now, what happens if I ignore this? Huh? He, I'm getting chased down. He's going to chase me down the highway. Then he's going to call his friends, and they're going to chase me down until they pull me over. And when they pull me over, it's not going to be a good day. I'm go, you're going to see me in. It's not going to be a good day. Pastor on the run. There I am. Running from the popo. Listen to me this morning. Listen, listen now. It's the same way in the spirit. It's the same way spiritual authority. You have authority in Jesus. When you place yourself underneath authority, when you go like this to a devil, he has to pull over. If he doesn't pull over, you call for the, all the angels of God and run his tail down till he's done and he's complete and he can't do nothing in your life. So whether that's a devil of sickness, whether that's a devil of strife, whether that's a devil of discord, whether that's a devil of lying, whatever the devil is, that you have authority in Jesus. When you place yourself under authority, now, baby, you can start to tell uh, them devils that try to mess with you, what to do. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Number five is this. The result is synergy. Synergy. Two more. Synergy, and I'll be finished. Synergy. There's a law called synergy or synergism, and the law states this. When the joint action of agents are brought together, They increase each other's effectiveness. So when we lay down our agenda and our individualism and we come together as the church and we're worshiping God together and we're believing that purposes and, and we're believing that purposes stirred, we have spiritual authority, we believe that we go vertical with God, we, we believe these things and we come together, all of a sudden there is a synergy that takes place. It's no longer, well, I'm going to do this and you're going to do that. No, no, no. All of a sudden there's a synergy that takes place and our effectiveness goes up. I heard this example about Belgian draft horses. It's one of the largest, strongest horses in the world. And competitions are held to see which horse can pull the, pull the most. And one Belgian horse can pull 8,000 pounds. Now, the strength involved with that in this is it's hard to imagine a horse pulling 8,000 pounds. So what would happen is we then speculate what would happen if we hook two of these horses together. 
If we hook two of these horses together, in our natural mind, we would say, oh, it could pull 16,000 pounds because one horse can pull 8,000, another horse can pull 8,000. That equals 16,000 pounds. But that would be the wrong assumption because when you put two draft horses pulling together, they, they cannot just pull twice as much but they actually can pull three times as much. When you put two of them together, that they can pull up to 24,000 pounds together, working together, working together. Now, not just that, if you take these two horses and you raise them together, you train them together, they think and pull as one. When they think and pull as one, they are trained, they are unified, and when they come together, they are paired together, and they can actually pull more than 24,000. They can pull 32,000 pounds together. What could we pull together? What would happen if we would come together and allow this idea of synergy, when we be synergized as the body, synergized together as the church, synergized together with God, that the church would come together in unity and we would break off like bickering, complaining, strife, all those sorts, lack of patience, all those sorts that we just break those things off of us and we came together in unity and we got into alignment with God that we would do more together. Think about that's just two horses. Think about it. If they put all of us together, what we can do, what we can do in our region, what we can do in our community, what we can do for the kingdom of God when we come together, it creates synergy. And the synergy doesn't stop when we're here. When we go home and we go back to work on Monday, we know we're a part of something that's not just ourselves. That we're a part of something greater that we come together, together and this synergy and this synergism starts taking place and all of a sudden things start to take place because why? We've laid down our individualism and put ourselves into a position to come together in unity to see God do some amazing things. The last one this morning is this. What is the result when we come together? Holy Spirit. Or let me put it in this terms. God shows up. I don't believe the lost today need another convinced cool three points in a poem. I don't think we need another cool service in America right now. Nobody's flocking to the church saying, let me see your cool light show anymore. Why? Because there's a real need that needs a real God to be displayed through real people that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God needs to show up not only in our churches, but in our state and in our country. And when we gather together, I will take nothing less than pushing pushing for God to show up in our midst, to sacrificing, to fasting, to praying, to believing, to touching every chair, that whatever person that comes through the doors would experience God. They wouldn't experience a great worship team. They wouldn't just experience, they wouldn't experience a, a great pastor and a message. They wouldn't experience great coffee and great experience. That's wonderful. We're going to do that. But at the end of the day, baby, we're not just going to have cake. We're gonna have icing on our cake and God's gonna show up in the midst of our church and he's gonna deliver people. He's gonna set people free. He's gonna transform life. Listen, God is about to show up. Listen, when the darkest day of our hour, when the day gets dark, that's the best time for Jesus to shine. Matthew 18 says this, and again I say to you, Golly, if two or you agree on anything, uh, agree on earth about anything they, they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Are we in his name today? That means he's here right now. He's not a liar, he's, he's full of truth. And when he says you gather together, there I am in the midst. And here's what I, here's, hold on, ready? Matthew 18 says, there am I among them. What if I read it this way? There I am among them. Let me do it like this. There I am is in the room. Let me do it like this. The name I am is how God introduced himself to Moses. And the word I am is this. 
he answered it. Moses was like, who, who am I going to tell him? Send me, Pharaoh. And God says, you tell him the I am sent you. In other words, the word I am means this. Whatever you need me to be in the moment, I am. So when God shows up in the room, whether it's finances, whether it's healing, whether it's encouragement, whether it's, whether it's freedom, whether it's deliverance, listen to me today. I want you to understand something. When I am comes in the room, everything changes. He's saying, whatever you need me to be in that moment, I will be. If you need forgiveness, I'm that. If you need healing, I'm that. If, I'm, if you need blessing, I'm that. If you need courage, I'm that. If you need comfort, I'm that. If you need restored, I'm that. If you need delivered, I'm that. If you need freedom, I'm that. It's all about Jesus showing up. I'll close with this. There's a song I like, and I want you to hear me this morning. It's called, When You Walk Into the Room. And I just want to read just a couple lyrics to you, because this is my heart. When we gather together, here's what the song says. When you walk into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. And when you walk into the room, every heart starts burning. And nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you. When, I, when he walks into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble at the light you bring. When you walk into the room, every heart starts burning. Listen to me, I'm going back. God's been dealing with me through this pandemic. We're not gonna try to scheme our way to reach lost people. We're gonna reach lost people by God showing up. Listen, he says, when I walk into the room, everything changes. Then he says this, sickness starts to vanish. Every hopeless situation ceases to exist. And when you walk into the room, the dead begin to rise because there is resurrection life in all you do. Here's our prayer out of this song for this morning. As we want the results of God in our church, Come and consume God, all we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. And when we come with that mentality, and we come with God consume us, we give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. When we live with that response, we get the right results. He comes, he delivers, he brings freedom. Listen, I refuse to, I refuse, I refuse to substitute God's presence for something carnal. I refuse to, to to lay down God's presence at the attempt to reach someone. You know why? Because that song, they didn't know it, but they wrote that for me. Because in May of 1994, when I was lonely, broken, filled with sin, he walked into my room. May of 1994, I was laying on the bedside and all of a sudden God walked into my room and everything changed from that moment. Every addiction fell off my life. Brokenness left me. Healing came. Forgiveness happened. Freedom took place in that moment. The addictions that I had struggled with for so many years fell off my life in a moment. It took 10 minutes. I was in an, I was in an alcoholic, uh, drunken state and I called out to God on my bedside. And when I called out to God on my bedside, he walked into the room. And when he walked into the room, within 10 minutes, everything changed. Well, pastor, I don't know. That's never happened to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. No matter what room you find yourself, in. He's going to show up to do what he said he would do. Stop 
shortchanging God. Start to give God credit for his awesome power of freedom and deliverance in your life. So if you're in this place this morning, do you need him to walk into the room? Do we need him to walk into the room? Do we need him to walk into the room of your heart? Do we need him? Do we need to be reminded of what it was like to be in the grave but come up out of that grave? Do we need to be reminded if you're a Christian and, and, and man, maybe you've, you've gone stale through this thing and you've been so focused on everything else. Let, let today be a reminder that when we gather together, God wants to show up in the midst. So if you're in this place today and you say, Pastor, I would like prayer. No matter, I'm not gonna call you forward. I just wanna see your hand. You're like, I want prayer. I, I want God to show up in my life. I want God to show up in our church. I wanna gather with those, expecting those results, that man, purpose is stirred, encouragement happens. Man, God is glorified. All of a sudden, if that's you, man, you're like, hey, Jason, I'm in, baby. I wanna see God do something. I wanna see an outbreak of God. I wanna see an awakening. I wanna see revival in the land. I don't just wanna settle any longer, but I'm gonna push, and I'm gonna push again, and I want God to come, and I want him to do something magnificent in our community, do something something magnificent in our region. If that's you, I'd like for you to stand. I want to pray for you. Just stand where you're at. Just, I want to pray for you. If that's you, if you're on board. Hey, man, if you're on board, that's what we want to pray for. Father, in the name of Jesus, this morning, thank you so much for those that, God, that, that say this is what we want. But more importantly, God, we're not after just a result. We're after you. You said, come and consume us of all we are. And so today, Lord, with hands lifted, we say, consume us, God. Do something brand new in our lives today, God. We give it all to you, Jesus. Have your way, God. Do an amazing thing through us, God. Stir purpose in us, Lord. Give us encouragement today. Fill us with courage, God. Today, Lord, we stir up the gift of God. We expect when two or three are gathered together, there you are. The I am is in the midst of us. And we're expecting deliverance. We're expecting freedom. We're expecting salvation. We're expecting we're expecting hope to rise in the name of Jesus today. And so, Lord, for those that are here and those that are in and those that are willing to go, I thank you so much in Jesus' name for the synergy that's going to be created through our church to go forth and see a region transformed, a state delivered, a country set on fire by the presence of God. Lord, I thank you today that no matter where we find ourselves walking into a room, you're going to walk into that room with us, whether it's a boardroom, whether it's our bedroom, whether it's our living room, whether it's our family room, whether it's at work, wherever we find ourselves, that you'll walk into the room with us. And because of that, lives will be changed, transformed, and delivered by the power of your name. We thank you for it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you guys give the Lord a big hand clap this morning? Come on, isn't he good? Come on, isn't he good?